CBS Fox Video presents a collector's preview. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace before the dark time. Before the Empire. An adventure unlike anything on your planet. <laughs> An epic of heroes. Coming too fast! Don't worry. Show all together. Baby, all together. <laughs> I got him! And villains. Now I am the master. You can't win, Darth. If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. The story of a boy, a girl, and a galaxy. The Force will be with you. Always. Star Wars, the saga begins. The adventure continues in The Empire Strikes Back. Vader wants us all dead. He doesn't want you at all. He's after somebody called a uh, Skywalker. Luke. A saga of rebellion. Echo Station 57, we're on our way. And romance. You know what you're doing. An epic of alien worlds. The cave is collapsing. This is no cave. What? And the climactic clash between good and evil. There is no escape. Don't make me destroy you. The Empire strikes back. The battle for freedom rages on in Return of the Jedi. Fighters coming in. Here we go again. The shield is down. The cunning of the enemy. Soon the rebellion will be crushed and young Skywalker will be one of us. Get alongside that one. The courage of a rebel. I am a Jedi. Not yet. You must Confront Vader. The power of evil. Is Darth Vader my father? Return of the Jedi. May the trilogy be with you for the best price ever. Plus, From Star Wars to Jedi is also available at a new low price. This stunning documentary takes you deep into the fascinating world created for the Star Wars trilogy. Action! Immerse yourself in the mind of George Lucas. Special effects are just a tool, a means of telling a story. A special effect without a story is a pretty boring thing. From storyboard to creature creation, from character development to the puppeteers who gave them life. Eventually, you actually take a real person and stick them into that character. And that real person brings with him or her an enormous package of reality. I mean, 3PO is just a hunk of plastic, and without Tony Daniels in there, it just isn't anything at all. Join George Lucas and friends for a delightful look at From Star Wars to Jedi. Hello in TV land. Collect the complete Star Wars trilogy one by one in their attractive new packages or in this collectible gift pack. But don't stop there. From Star Wars to Jedi, the fascinating saga behind the saga will make your video library complete. They're unlike anything in our galaxy. Check for title availability wherever videos are sold. And now, for our feature presentation.
Ten years ago, in a galaxy very, very near, George Lucas imagined a world no one else had ever seen. When he placed it on screen in Star Wars in 1977, he asked us to see it through the eyes of a restless and idealistic young man, Luke Skywalker. Through three films, Luke would travel to the farthest reaches of his galaxy, seeking adventure and manhood and wisdom. It would be a perilous journey, for this was a universe in turmoil, with the forces of light and darkness locked in mortal combat. The Dark Lord of the Sith, exemplar and symbol of all the evil Luke would ultimately have to confront, Darth Vader. On his long journey to that final confrontation, Luke would take strength and wisdom from a gentle, perfect knight. Remember, a Jedi can feel the Force flowing through him. And take knowledge from astounding sources. Do or do not. There is no try. Along his way, he would discover that like everyone else, he contained all the world's possibilities within himself. The dark side of the force as well as the light. There was a bold and beautiful princess at the center of his universe. The bond they felt was powerful. And it was deepened by all that they shared. Han Solo, hot pilot and cool adventurer, was a man for all risks. This bucket of bolts is never going to get us past that blockade. This baby's got a few surprises left in her sweetheart. The possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. Lando Calrissian, that charming rogue, joined the Brotherhood of the Brave in The Empire Strikes Back. Their allies came in many strange shapes and sizes and sustained them in every climate, even against impossible odds. But finally, a man must confront his destiny alone. Strike me down with all of your hatred and your journey towards the dark side will be complete. In Return of the Jedi, Luke would reach the heart of darkness and its terrible temptations. The vision was unprecedented. So was the task of placing it on film. This is the saga behind the saga. Tunisia, 1975. The Star Wars company arrives at its first location. Besides conceiving and writing the film, George Lucas served as director. On such a complex project, that's at least one job too many, according to George. George co-wrote The Empire Strikes Back, oversaw pre- and post-production, and Irvin Kirshner directed. All the saga's directors. The newest member of a very exclusive club is Richard Marquand, right, who directed Jedi. Here's what I'm no, the coach oh. day. Huh? Coach day. <laughs> In the desert near Yuma, Arizona, Richard would lead cast and crew through heat and sandstorms to complete one of Jedi's major sequences. We worked four weeks to realize what George and Richard had planned months before on a model. George was everywhere as we geared up to shoot. Here he's checking storyboards with designer Joe Johnston. The battle of the big ships is still going on out beyond yeah. the Death Star, right? Well, as, as the as fighters I mean, go as, in, as the fighters go in, we assume that the rebel cruisers also start to go in. Yeah. He even turned up at my costume fitting. This is actually quite similar to your outfit in the first film. It is. Just a black version that's a little bit more Jedi-like. Jedi was more than a saga's climax. It offered George a chance few filmmakers get, the opportunity to improve on ideas, settings, and characters he had introduced in his earlier works. The 
took so much effort to get up to speed, which was essentially to make the first film. And I created this great world, but I didn't have the fun of being able to run around in it. Now that I knew the world and I could see it, and it was a real thing, it, it brings up all kinds of ideas of things and funny moments and, and adventures that you could have in that environment that you've created. Uh, and I never got to exploit that. And I always felt, when my first film is it, now if I went back and make another film in that environment using those characters, I could make a hell of a better movie. I mean, it would just be infinitely more exciting and interesting and fascinating. Because the first one was just trying to, you know, you're in a foreign environment and you just don't know what's going on. And it's the same for the author as it is for the audience. Remember the Star Wars Cantina? Everyone loved it, except George. This was one of the things he always thought could be done better sometime. Well, I'd, I'd always wanted to have the cantina be more than what it was. It was originally designed to be uh, lots of very exotic creatures. And when I shot it, I just didn't have the money and uh, the makeup man was ill and couldn't finish the masks. And so I was always left with um, sort of a less articulated monsters and less effective scene than I thought was necessary. <laughs> This is the monster rally of George's dreams. The setting is the palace of Jabba the Hutt, godfather of the galaxy and host to aliens from a thousand worlds. Jabba's band was designed by Phil Tippett. He's head of the Creature Shop at Industrial Light and Magic. More than 80 creatures lurked in the shadows of Jabba's palace. That's more monsters by far than have ever been assembled for a single movie. They all began to take shape like this, as small models called maquettes. Most of them were sculpted over and over again before they were approved. A team of 15 artists, aided by other craftsmen, worked 13 months, the last six of them on a day and night basis, to translate the maquettes into full-scale clay models of puppets and masks. Well over a million dollars was spent on creature development and construction. Molds were made from the clay models. From these, the monstrous faces and forms took shape in latex and rubber. Painting was painstaking. The creatures had to have that lived-in look. Maybe they were not of this earth, but they had to seem as if they were of some earth somewhere. The young Frankensteins frequently cracked up each other. It was a way of easing the strain of a long, hard job. Make way, make way, pig in transit. Even when the masks and costumes were molded and painted, the work wasn't finished. For most of the featured creatures had to be able to express themselves. Some of these pig guards, for instance, would have a large range of facial movements available for their close shots. The muscles controlling expression were actually either wire cables or air tubes connected to a bellows out of camera range. Over the months of work, 
something of the personalities of their creators just naturally worked its way into the finished creatures. Cy Snoodles, lead singer in Java's band, began her career as a dancer. But Max Rebo was first and last a keyboard artist. George made frequent visits to check on the progress of the creatures as they were being developed. Hey, that's great. Yeah, so yeah, it's like a... Joel's uh, way to open the yeah. and do it. Like he's it's coming down to the, one of the more amusing things will be to have this, have a vocalist. How about Snooty? So we can have her be the singer. Sure. Yeah, it'd be great. She's got such a tiny little mouth. <laughs> She's going to sing lyrics. We're going to have to articulate her mouth. Well, yeah, it would have to be. Uh, what it means is we'd have to figure out a way of opening the mouth and and making it at least open and close. Thing is, it doesn't have to be articulate. All it has to do is be able to open and close. It's a binary system, which goes like this, 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 this. Wow, this, 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 this. and that gives us some room to yeah. come up with some lyrics and make a song. And also give us a great way of spotlighting. Miss Snooty's basic movements were provided by puppeteer Tim Rose, working below her stage. His legs were connected to hers by rods, so she could duplicate his steps precisely. Her microphone was also controlled from below stage, also by a rod. This, in turn, controlled movement of Snooty's snoot, which was connected to the mic by a wire that would be invisible in the final film. More wires connect Snooty's upper body with another operator, who works her as if she were a giant marionette. Her song was written in English, but translated into Hatiz, Java's official court language. Pack-up night in the creature shop turned into a farewell party. Came the dawn, time to go. Hey, did you hear that? We're going to England. <laughs> oh boy, hey Edgar, get your suitcase. <laughs>
He was always intended to be this loathsome, large, monstrous creature. But it wasn't possible to incorporate my design of Jabba when we shot the scene with the actors on the set. Uh, so I came up with the idea of shooting the scene with a man, and eventually I would mat in a stop-motion creature over the man. Solo! This is the scene George shot for Star Wars, but decided not to finish. Solo! Right here, Jabba. I've been waiting for you. Have you not? You didn't think I was going to run, did you? Ah, my boy. There are times you disappoint me. Why haven't you paid me? And why did you have to fry poor Greedo like that? After all, we've been through together. Look, Jabba, next time you want to talk to me, come see me yourself. Don't send one of these twerps. Han. Han. Understand. I just can't afford to make exceptions. When we came to uh, Jedi, I was able to redesign the monster, start from scratch. Uh, in the first film, it, the, the fact that he was walking and certain things you know, demanded a certain type of creature. Uh, this way I was able to have more freedom in creating the creature and uh, make him an even more interesting character than he would had originally been designed in the first film. Jabba needed a lot of help getting around. Finished, he weighed over 2,000 pounds. He also needed help getting himself, not to mention his act, together. Here's a working drawing of Java, showing where his heart and soul, his operators, were located. I operate Jabba's right arm and the jaw of his mouth, and I do the, the voice at the moment to uh, make the lip sync. And uh, between Toby and myself, we do the body movements, the rocking of the, of the whole figure. And yeah, well, I'm, the, I'm the silent brain hemisphere. I either do the left hand and the tongue. And uh, that goes in here. And my right hand is free inside the head. And uh, basically works this head control, tipping it left and right, front and back and up and down. I have one other control that can swivel the head, revolve it. And uh, for certain shots, I have things like the tongue here, where my hand goes. I have a couple of cable controls that do snarls around the mouth. And... Um, Using my feet and the weight of my body, I, I share with David the job of actually moving the body about. These uh, hand controls here, these two, operate the twitches around the corners of the mouth, middle of the mouth, lower jaw, and also the nostrils. And my feet work the bellows, which in turn works the respiratory system of the beast, the lungs. smoke from this cigar is for Jabba. When he smokes his pipe, I blow it up the tube and it trickles out of the corner of his mouth. If I was drinking port, it would be a perfect job. Now, this is the middle part of the tail, and this little bit is the little end piece, which the way I move it depends on the mood he's in at the time. If he's in a, a, a bit of an irritable mood, I just do the little flips like you bang your fingers if he was losing your temper or impatient or if he's really losing his temper he just give it a good old thrash on like that or backwards and forwards backwards and forwards and if he's in a lazy mood you just keep it like that nice steady movement well, i tell you java's getting very good is he <laughs> yes he's getting very good uh <laughs> he's almost star now oh good we have to be very nice to <laughs> I like his I mean, tattoo. He is what he is. That's the thing. He doesn't pretend to be anything else. He doesn't feel the need to be charming or anything. He's just an unpretentious, very straightforward guy. Can you munch your lips again, Dave? <laughs> Ten puppeteers and nine mime artists, along with 42 extras and 18 principals, supported by a crew of 90, worked almost a month to make this sequence. Communication between the masked players, Jabba's hidden operators, and the rest of the cast and crew was a problem. A makeup person was assigned to Jabba full time. Relatively speaking, the rest of us required much less attention. Put on the eye. And he's now got the idea, so her rope is coming in very well. And on a shot of your two hands doing it without her in the background, and just some. Hey, sweetheart, I like your threads. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'll bring him you in. Think that'll work that way? Yeah, I think it'll work. Right I'll away. do it without moving yeah. my mouth, so if you decide not to use it. <laughs> Red line, let's go. Settle down, please. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sorry, matey. Just a little foreground smoke, please. Yes, please. Turn over. The heart of the scene. Luke confronts Java. The fate of his captured friends at stake. And action. You will bring Captain Solo and the Wookiee to me. On set, one of Jabba's operators spoke his lines in English. His awesome voice, speaking Hatties, was added later. Your mind powers will not work on me, boy. Nevertheless, I'm taking Captain Solo and his friends. You can either profit by this or be destroyed. It's your choice, but I warn you not to underestimate my power. <sighs> Master Luke, you're standing on... When Richard Marquan called cut, it was a relief, especially for the actors working under the mask. They were stifling. <laughs> when there wasn't time to unmask, cool air was blown in. Okay, I think I'll survive for a while. All right. No, no, no. <laughs> no, the floor drops away. I just go into a tuck and roll, and the most the, the, the most dangerous part of the stunt is getting out of the way of the Gamorrean guard that falls on top of me because he weighs about 200 pounds. That's played by me. <laughs> backing up and the pig is right here trying to get into the thing mm -hmm. so George and his staff and study temporary shots in the editing room roar and he's maybe looking at Luke and then he turns this footage will guide the, the making of the final scene mm -hmm. all right now here is the shot that has to be done with taste taking it like here where we get the pig guard right in there and the mouth just starts to come down on it and we cut away. What I want him to do is turn around and look at Luke, and then, as he's looking, you know, the, the hand is sort of dangling out of his hand, and the, you know, and he's gobb he was chewing as he turns, and he, you know, slurps it up, gobbles it up, and the hand disappears Ooh. down his, yeah, you know, just beginning. Yeah. And then starts to move forward. <laughs> Art director Joe Johnston sketches the new ideas. From his sketches, Joe created a storyboard for Phil Tippett, who played the Ranker in this early incarnation. Yes, that's Phil underneath that rubber suit. Dennis Murin directed miniature special effects photography. His colleagues, Richard Edlund and Ken Ralston, did our space shots. The technique for animating a classic fairy tale situation, the dragon in his lair, is itself a classic. It was used in Japanese monster movies like Godzilla. The filmmakers hoped to improve it enough to use it in the final film, especially Phil, who found his role inspiring. Raise the gate. In the end, though, the Ranker's cave was reduced to snugger proportions. It was about 30 inches high. The Ranker himself was scaled down to an 18-inch puppet. Phil's hand animated his head. Rods moved the rest of his body. He was photographed in slow motion, so his movements would appear massive and menacing. The Rancor is a sleight-of-hand trick created by expert magicians for a medium that is literally quicker than the eye. In Arizona, George Lucas a stately pleasure barge decreed. It was probably the biggest set ever built for a movie location. It was to be the site of our final showdown with that vile gangster, Jabba the Hutt. The barge itself was 212 feet long and 80 feet high. 
close to 100 workmen labored four months to build the barge. Preparation of the site began a year before we arrived. Okay. Yet it would appear on film, a bit here, a piece there, for only a couple of minutes. Okay, very good, everybody. Can we walk away in the shoot, please? Thank you very much. Clear away. All of this effort illustrates one of George's basic filmmaking principles. One of the fatal mistakes that almost every science fiction film makes is that they spend so much time on the settings, you know, creating the environment, that they spend film time on it. And you don't have to spend too much film time to create an environment. What they're doing is showing off the amount of work that they generated, uh, and it slows the pace of the film down. And the story is not the settings, the story is the story, it's the plot. In the Star Wars world, we have our own way of telling a story, very rapidly. <laughs> Star Wars style is based on two things. The editing pace of sequences like the barge battle, the speed of movement through the frame. Of course, we sometimes slow down to catch our breath and reflect on the often astonishing beauty of our imagined world. But not for long. Admiral, we're in position. All groups assume attack coordinates. In his mind, George was jumping to hyperspace long before he visualized the process for the rest of us. I've always been fascinated in speed because of uh, my interest in cars and racing. And uh, since I enjoy that, I enjoy the sensation of racing along at high speed, uh, that has been an element in the films. <laughs> Never more vividly than in Jedi's space battle. Light is coming in. In the end, it's just each film is a new challenge in trying to explore the idea of uh, telling a story cinematically and giving less and less exposition and uh, having the the pace be such that you can have impressions of images thrown on top of each other without um, and, and, and get a whole new sense of a story or a, a feeling. Society has definitely sped up in its uh, perception uh, of uh, visual material, uh, primarily as a result of television, television commercials. Uh, younger people are more and more able to discern and understand the visual language. Uh, and um, I think part of that process that I'm experimenting with in Star Wars is, and also Raiders of the Lost Ark, is, is that, uh, that uh, ability for people to perceive and, and uh, digest information rapidly. There's a lot going on in there thematically and, and idea-wise, both on the mythological level and the sort of basic human psycho psychological level, and on uh, dealing with certain problems that face 
our society and, and say thematic in terms of, of man-machine relationships. I've noticed as I continue to experiment to see if I can get things, how fast I can get things before they're incomprehensible, uh, that uh, it sort of coincides with my personal life as my personal life as I've become more and more successful and the hectic pace of my life has sped up. Uh, it seems that the films have sped up too. Okay, and action, go. Jedi's fastest scene began slow and small. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. that's it, it's real smooth. These videotapes of the models in action were made months before principal photography began. They guided creation of the final sequence at every stage of its development. I mean, they're real, what about a real close one on that bike? They're like really close. Yeah. But all you see is this big thing dropping behind him in its loop. Instead of trying to even play, you know, like almost as, like even closer than this, like that. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Okay, so this will be four, so let's use that slate. So close shot. Focus at about two inches. That's it. Dennis Murin and Joe Johnston aren't playing with and toys. Ready? They're working yep. with them to make moving storyboards for the speeder bike sequence. <laughs> See if we can get the real shots done this fast. Okay. These shots, called animatics, were cut together into a full but small scale version of the sequence as it would appear in the final film. The editors even added temporary sound effects. Next shot. And yeah. number. 80. 80. Now he won't stand up. There we go. Uh. Come on, Luke. Okay, ready? Yep. And action. Right. Interesting to compare these in uh, a year or so to the final shots. Here are the final shots, which took another year to complete. That process began in a redwood forest in Northern California. These men are using a steady cam to make background plates for the scene. The gyroscopically mounted camera will in effect smooth their passage, providing bump-free images that seem to soar. They are shooting in extreme slow motion, two frames per second. When their film is projected like this, it will create a streaking succession of high-speed images. Foreground objects, or actors, to be seen moving against the background are shot against a blue screen. From these shots, black and white mats are generated. These are combined with the background to create a holdout area where the foreground image can be placed in final printing as it is in this shot from the finished film. It's necessary to use puppets like this one of Princess Leia for some blue screen work, especially when it involves high speed action that can't be photographed full scale. In shots of this kind, the object remains stationary and the camera provides the motion. These rapid pullbacks will be used in the film to create the illusion of the bike speeding away from camera, heading for infinity. The editors spoke temporary dialogue for the animatic tapes, which were constantly consulted as the scene came together. As you can see, we duplicated the animatic sequence when we did this shot against the blue screen. Get alongside that one! Here's how all the elements we've seen in the process of creation are finally brought together in the finished film. Well, the bike chase seems faster. I mean, it's traveling along at a great amount of speed, but at the same time, uh, it's more realistic than, say, the trench battle in the first film. Uh, the trench battle is fairly clean. Uh, you're speeding along. It's a fairly abstract graphic that's coming at you. There are uh, laser bolts and things going around you, but it uh, takes place in outer space. It's in an environment that you don't understand. The, what makes the speeder bike chase seem faster and work better is the fact that you're in a real forest and there are trees 
that you could crash into. Uh, that element, just the, it's again, it's a it's a dramatic element, it's a plot element. It's the trench, only we've put some obstacles in there that you might hit. And once you do that, it becomes infinitely more dramatic. <laughs> pace, plot. They're meaningless without great characters to motivate them. Star Wars has been rich in those from the beginning. How did we get into this mess? I really don't know how. We seem to be made to suffer. It's our lot in life. You're always surprised with characters. I mean, in film, it's even more dramatic than it is in, uh, in writing, because eventually you actually take a real person and stick them into that character. And that real person brings with him or her an enormous package of reality. I mean, 3PO is just a hunk of plastic. And without Tony Daniels in there, it just isn't anything at all. I had a different idea for the character originally. I wanted him to be more of a used car dealer, very slicko, very oily. But that character inhabited that costume so strongly because of what Tony had done that I couldn't change it. Where do you think you're going? Well, I'm not going that way. It's much too rocky. This way is much easier. What makes you think there are settlements over there? Don't get technical with me. What mission? What are you talking about? I've just about had enough of you. Go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. And don't let me catch you following me, begging for help, because you won't get it. If it required an act of high imagination to create a lovable droid, think of what was involved in creating a new star for Empire. When I came to the second film, to start working on uh, The Empire Strikes Back, um, a lot of the information and the training that takes place was originally designed to be done by Ben. But since I killed off Ben in the first film, uh, it left me with a lot of exposition, a lot of training scenes that I didn't have anybody to perform. So I had to come up with a new Jedi Master who was even more powerful than Ben. And I had to come up with somebody who would be interesting to watch. I mean, I was very apprehensive about how that was going to work. Could I take a main character in a movie and use a little rubber puppet? And would that... I mean, is it going to happen, or is it just going to be a disaster? And, uh, and right up until the moment where he was on film and talking, it looked like it was going to be a disaster. You know, little hints, but it looks pretty good, and Frank can do some really funny things, and that sort of seems to work, and is it going to happen? But then when it goes onto the screen, it's magic. <laughs> You're making a mess. Mm. Hey, mm. give me that. Mine! Or I will help you not. I don't want your help. I want my lamp back. I'm gonna need it to get out of this slimy mud hole. Mud hole? Slimy? My hole, this is! Uh, R2, let him have it. Mine! 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 R2! <laughs> Move along, little fellow. We got a lot of work to do. No, no, no. Stay and help you, I will. <laughs> Find your friend. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for a friend. I'm looking for a Jedi Master. Uh, Jedi Master? Yoda. You seek Yoda. You know him? Mm -hmm. Take it to him, I will. <laughs> yes, yes. But now, let's eat. Come. Good food, come! <laughs> I think more than anything else with Star Wars is the characters have always been a surprise and a delight as they've come to life. Language establishes character. Composer John Williams takes a short course in Ewok ease from Ben Burt, 
who invented all the Star Wars dialects. The pitch is sort of midget-like, isn't it? Also, if his voice is going to be sped up a little bit or raised in pitch the way these have been, if you start out with, an, I say, an average human voice, mine or Jim Bloom, and you raise it in pitch, it tends to sound a little like Chip and Dale. But it's, it's easier to get a foreign language and to have someone speak it and make it come across as a real language than just to make one up. Because when you make one up, it tends to sound like English, just rearranged pig phonies. Right. Yeah. It tends to be a pig line. So what we've done in the past is really just take interesting words and use them. Sometimes, sometimes mix Swahili with uh, Chinese or something. I mean, there's, there's no attempt to make it literal. Backwards sometimes. Backwards is a limited thing because things are generally can be identified as backwards. Way, These are voices that we've recorded and stuff, and uh, it, as if they were just you're in the forest and you suddenly go into the Ewok village and you're just trucking through it. You hear what they're doing. The Ewok environment was composed of this matte painting a California forest, and this studio set in London. Just get him louder on that. So then the yeah. next guy says, more firewood. Okay. I look to Mark and say, well, that didn't do us very much good. And I say, but these are my friends. 3PO, tell, uh, tell them. They must be set free. Then move. 3PO, tell them if, if they don't do as you wish, you'll become angry and use your magic. Uh, no, you, Master Luke, what magic? I couldn't possibly. Tell them. Uh, do you want it's not going to work as a joke. Unless we both say exactly the same thing. Okay, what do you and want to say? And it's the exact same thing. Tell pace. them or just... Tell them. Let's both do it carefully. Okay. Tell them. Oh, can I do it too? No. Okay. <laughs> right through to the end of the whole oh, great. movie. Oh, great. Really so you put the down putting down to later. Yes. Next, actually. Next. And then the levitation. And then the undoing. Okay. Right, the actors, step in, please. Have a rehearsal, Bill. 25 feet 7. You sort of realize that these would be good allies. Uh -huh. So what you're going to do is make them allies. That's uh -huh. that's so that's you're just going to sort of play along, right. and wait until it your is, moment, and then you're going to... It's very telling that I let them take my weapons. It's yeah. that, that it, there's a moment there where I could either strike out or, or you could kill relax. Them well, you got yeah. a sense of the future. you got uh -huh. a sense of yeah. the fact that it's these little funny teddy bears that could destroy the Empire. Uh -huh. you know, it's always in a fairy tale. Huh? It's oh. always being nice to the little bunny rabbit on the side of the road that gives you the magic that makes you go into uh -huh. the princess from the evil witch. The Ewoks are a variation on a concept that was part of George's vision of Star Wars from the beginning. In the original screenplay, it was a society of Wookiees who, who uh, had this giant ground battle with the Empire at the end of the film and also a space battle. And they were trained to fly ships and uh, they were able to take over uh, the empire. Well, in, in the evolution of the script, I realized I couldn't do this giant battle. When I came to the third film, and the battle was back in again, and I could actually do the battle, uh, I couldn't use Wookiees, because I had established Chewbacca as being a relatively sophisticated creature. He could fly spaceships, runs around. He's not, he's not the primitive that he was in the original screenplay. So I had to develop a new kind of Wookiee, or a new kind of creature, that was primitive, a new primitive society. So what I decided to do was, since they were a, the underdog, so to speak, what I'd do is, instead of making them incredibly tall the way Wookiees are, I'd make them incredibly short. And uh, at the same time, to make them look different from Wookiees, I'd give them short fur instead of long fur. That's really where the Ewok evolved. There is one that's sort of right over there. Uh -huh. Uh, you should look at the ones we've done. We've very carefully brought all this down and across here and there. Otherwise, it looks like flesh, and that all begins to merge. It looks like a human face. Ewoks getting ready to rise. This is the last live action sequence shot for the saga. Okay, we're going to keep you 12 here. We're going to okay. spread you out through the bushes, and you come into this position. <laughs>
Ewok battle uh, was one of the main uh, inspirations for the whole project when I first started Star Wars, and it evolved out of my interest in a project I'd been working on uh, at the time about the Vietnam War. And uh, one of the more fascinating aspects of that project was the human spirit, the human element, uh, being able to withstand an onslaught of, of uh, uh, high technology and, and how the high technology had failed. To win their war against the Empire, the Ewoks had to recruit allies among the special effects people. Appropriately, most of their work was with miniatures. In the first film, we took special effects from a kind of zero point and got it up and running to the point where we, I could tell the story that I wanted to tell, space battle, fast moving. Uh, and get the point across, uh, just barely. A lot of it was done editorially, a lot of it was done sort of tricks, sleight of hand. But we had gone so far in realizing a concept of special effects of just moving spaceships. I mean, being able to pan with spaceships and be able to, to, to have a, a certain cinematic freedom in shooting those kinds of effects, uh, that had a very powerful impact on the t storytelling. Special effects are just a tool, a means of telling a story. People have a tendency to confuse them as an end to themselves. Uh, a special effect without a story is a pretty boring thing. Effects in the story's service. The duel in The Empire Strikes Back. You are beaten. It is useless to resist. Don't let yourself be destroyed as Obi-Wan did. There is no escape. Don't make me destroy you. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough! As that evolved, and say I did the first film, I didn't know that uh, how the public would take all this, and that it would be as successful as it was, and Darth Vader would become the character that he became, and and uh, so when I got down to uh, the second film, I had to make a decision about whether I was really going to go through with this thing of him being his father, and uh, finally decided that that really was the way, I mean, it was the original story, and that was the one I really liked the most, and so I'd stick with it. In Jedi, father and son faced one another for the last time. Uh, in the end, I had a problem with, in the fight between, between Luke and his father, of why he makes the final turn. Luke makes the final turn to the bad side of the Force and tries to kill his father. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the heat flow through you. <laughs> Obi-Wan has taught you well. 
This was the moment toward which the entire saga had always aimed. I will not fight your father. But ironically, a vital immediate motivation was still missing when we came to shoot it. Richard was trying to block out the fight between uh, Luke and, and Vader. And we got down to that point underneath the, underneath the throne room there. And he said, you know, the script sort of said, and Vader uh, says something that upsets Luke or something vague like that. Uh, I, I, I can't remember exactly what the script said, but it was very vague. Uh, spark and we didn't have that actual moment that we needed where Luke at you you got the sense that Luke is hiding he's not gonna fight him he refuses to fight he'd rather die first and then so, something turns him around and makes him fight uh, and I had never really come up with a satisfactory answer to that of what he could possibly say that would set Luke off and then it just I say in the process of evolving the script and, and evolving the importance of, of Leah as the sister, uh, you know, it was, it was sitting right there in front of my face and it became obvious that uh, turning her to the dark side would be the thing that would set Luke off again. After Darth Vader has been this, become, been thrust into this huge persona that I never expected to have happen, uh, do I still take the mask off and have him be this funny little man? Well, again, my, I sort of came to the decision of that was the original story. That's the way it should be. And if the public can't deal with it, then what can I do about it? A lot of people have objected to the fact that there's a human in there at all. But the film is about human frailties. It's not about monsters. Luke, help me take this mask off. But you'll die. Nothing can stop that now. Just for once, let me look on you with my own eyes. I think what happens in a project when you're with it and with the characters is, which is what happened to me in the first one, sort of led me along this course, is you fall in love with the characters and you fall in love with the environment. It's like a home. You feel very comfortable making up things that happen in there. It becomes your own little fantasy land, I think. And the reality is, is I love that world. I mean, there are friends there. It's like a home, I have a home there. And uh, so there's always going to be a desire on my part to uh, go home again or to be with my friends again.
as attractive as the Star Wars world is, uh, sooner or later you have to leave home and go on to some other place.